Good evening. I'm Jim Fentner, and I'm the chair of the Chemical Engineering Department at the University of Washington. I'm very excited to welcome you to our second and final lecture of this year's series. I also want to welcome those of you watching at home via our live webcast. Parents of children with brain disease often struggle to find effective therapies for newborns and babies. That's because there's a significant gap in therapeutic development for these populations. Therapies are commonly designed and tested on adults, and pediatric clinical trials often follow years after. Our speaker tonight will help fill that gap. Elizabeth Nance is a Jagjeet and Janice Binder Endowed Career Development Associate Professor of Chemical Engineering. She also has appointments in bioengineering, radiology, and affiliate memberships with the Washington eScience Institute, the Molecular Engineering and Sciences Institute, and the Center on Human Development and Disability. To date, her research and teaching program here at the University of Washington has received enormous recognition and acclaim. The list of recognition and accolades is too long to do justice in my short introduction, but I will note that Elizabeth is a recipient of the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, one of the highest honors our country awards to top academics and researchers. As you'll hear tonight, Elizabeth uses nanotechnology, neurobiology, and data science tools to develop nanotherapeutic platforms to treat brain disease. It is my privilege to introduce to you and ask you to join me in welcoming my friend and colleague, Professor Elizabeth Nance. Good evening, everybody. Can everybody hear me okay? Great. Uh, thank you so much, Jim, for that introduction. And thank you to everybody for uh, joining us this evening. I'm really excited to share our work in engineering technologies for the pediatric brain, um, which we are based in the Department of Chemical Engineering, so hopefully also give you the chemical engineering point of view on that problem. Uh, I do want to start off by acknowledging that here at the University of Washington, we do all of our research on the land of the Coast Salish peoples. I do think it's important uh, that we always pay respect to this land, its shared waters, and those who have been stewards of this land throughout generations, and that we honor with gratitude the indigenous peoples who actively create, shape, and contribute to our communities, including our College of Engineering community. I also love to start off with this slide um, because this talk would not be possible without the incredible individuals that I get to work with in my group uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, everybody that's in the color photos are all current lab members. Um, all of those that are in the black and white are past lab members. And you can see there's an extraordinary team here that really inspires me uh, and shows that the future is quite bright in this research area. I also have here on the bottom our list of uh, many of our collaborators, and I highlight this just to show how interdisciplinary this work is and how much it's needed to be interdisciplinary. So we work with a lot of individuals here at UW, which are all highlighted in purple, um, across a range of different departments, pediatrics, chemical engineering, OB gynecology, chemistry, electrical computer engineering, um, a number of different uh, departments. We also have a number of different collaborators that make this work uh, have higher impact and more value uh, in, in the US as well as internationally. So you'll see a lot of the work uh, today being highlighted from many of these uh, individual contributions. So what are we talking about uh, this, uh, this evening? Well, uh, we heard from Jim in the introduction that children make up a little less than a third of the world's population, but they have a disproportionate impact on the global disease burden. In fact, if we look at the number of lost healthy life years and we zoom in on just those that are done, uh, contributed to by neonatal disorders, we see a significant amount, about 200 million lost healthy life years just from neonatal disorders. Now what's particularly important is that more than 50% of those lost healthy life years, which are referred to as dailies, are due to the burden of disease in children under the age of five. So there's really a significant drive here to develop therapeutics for this patient population. But unfortunately, we see a pretty significant technology gap in developing technology, particularly drugs, um, to treat these, these diseases. Pediatric trials make up about 17% of all clinical trials, and neonatal trials make up only about 7%. And these trials also enroll a, a smaller number of patients compared to adult trials because it's a smaller patient population. Now, even when something is tested in these populations in clinical trials, it's usually tested after first being done in adults. And so many therapeutics are actually translated from the adult population, and they're either used off-label or as an adjusted dose from adults. 
And even in that scenario, it takes another seven years for this translational process to happen. So we have a technology gap and we have a translational gap, both of which there's not a lot of investment in to try and bridge. And this is because it's pretty complicated to treat a kid. In addition to having small patient numbers, you can imagine a number of reasons why we might be concerned about putting things into newborns or children. But I'm gonna focus on a couple of aspects that really complicate it from the engineering design perspective that we'll try and tackle uh, in tonight's lecture. First, as we all know, we can remember when we were children, probably, how much we change uh, in a very short time period. And I wanna highlight specifically how much we change from the perspective of a drug being effective within your body. So if we look at the blood in the body from the time we're born to early adolescence, we have rapidly changing body fat composition, we have rapidly changing body water composition, we have decreasing body surface area to weight, all of these things will affect how a drug distributes and, and interacts within the body. In our blood, we also have proteins that change in concentration that will affect how a drug gets recognized by the body. If we go into the stomach, say we were gonna give something by, uh, through the mouth, then we see that our stomach actually becomes more acidic over time from birth to adolescence. Our stomach also slows down in how fast it empties. So if we're thinking about how a drug is actually getting into the body, all of these factors will, will impact that. If we look at the liver, one of our most critical organs in terms of metabolizing drugs and breaking down drugs so that they can be used by the body, we see that we have increasing metabolic enzyme content that takes place from the time of birth up to adolescence, and in particular doesn't reach normal adult levels until late adolescent stage. And so our metabolism of drugs is going to be impacted at these different developmental stages. Our kidney is another critical organ in how the drugs, how drugs in our body um, influence, the, are, are impacted in terms of effectiveness. Our kidneys are one of the primary organs for clearing out any byproducts of drugs or drugs that aren't processed by the body. And we see that we have an increasing rate of clearance that happens from birth um, into the toddler years. And then we have a few other factors like our circulation rates, uh, our cardiac output changes across this developmental time scale, and our rate of ventilation. So if we were thinking about giving something by an inhaler, um, that's gonna also be affected across this developmental period. All this is really to show that each of these developmental stages has a unique physiology to it, necessitating us to really think about developing therapies that are specific to these developmental stages and not adjusted from an adult dose. So what can we do as engineers to address this therapeutic uh, need for children and newborns? I'm gonna start really, really big picture here. I think it's really important for us as engineers to pay attention to the translational aspect of the work that we do and keep in mind many of the factors that influence what results in implementation of a technology in a patient population. We certainly need to think about safety in this patient population, so making sure that we're giving and designing therapeutics that are gonna be safe and non-toxic to these rapidly developing systems. We wanna make sure that the cost and the accessibility are within reason. I didn't mention it on that earlier slide, but that global disease burden is disproportionately affected and higher in low and middle income countries or low resource settings than it is in high income countries or high resource settings. So if we're thinking about infrastructure or capability to store medicines, to distribute medicines, accessibility has to come into play here. We also have to think about the scale-up process. So how easy is it for us to take something that we've made on the bench and actually scale it up to the, side, to the amount of product that we might need to distribute to the patient population? And this one's particularly important because we need to think about how these drugs get approved by the Food and Drug Administration, what they're benchmarking against, and how complicated they might be in terms of their design for translation. So today I'm gonna to focus on how we sort of tackle these problems from the perspective of developing therapeutics for the newborn injured brain. And I'm gonna motivate why we specifically focus on newborn brain injury, because this is part of that burden of neonatal disorders that I showed you on the earlier slide. I'm gonna do a little uh, experiment in the room. I want everybody to take a minute and look at the people around you, or if you're online, look at yourself on your screen, one of those two things. And I want you to just uh, appreciate the fact that you have all, you're all here, so you've all lived through one of the riskiest periods of your life. But many babies don't. Many babies will die, about a million will die within the first 24 hours of life. 
Another million will die within the first week, and another half million will die within the first month. And there's some leading causes of what, of what results in this outcome. Typically, it is either due to being born preterm, being born before 40 weeks gestation, or having a perinatal asphyxia event around birth, loss of oxygen and blood flow, as shown by this schematic down here, to the entire brain. Now, babies that are born with this perinatal asphyxia event will go on to develop a significantly altered state of brain function, like de neurodevelopmental delays, cerebral palsy, for example. Babies that are born preterm are not out of the clear if they survive. We're seeing that babies that are born extremely preterm, I'm going to put the line on this graph so you have a sense of where we're looking at here, uh, at 28 weeks uh, or earlier, are surviving longer due to advances in neonatal care, but if they survive, they're not surviving without neurological impairment. So the less likely you are to survive, and if you do survive, the less likely you are to survive without neurological impairment. And this is an urgent and pressing problem because the proportion of infants being born preterm is increasing, not just in, uh, in low and middle income countries, but also in the US. And what we're also seeing is some corresponding cl clinical evidence that being born premature or having an early in life brain injury is gonna increase your risk of later in life brain injury as well. So for instance, if you were to have a stroke or a TBI later in life, your outcomes may be worse if you, had a, if you were born preterm or had an earlier in life brain injury. So there's really a pressing and urgent need to be thinking about therapeutics for this patient population. So what can we do to address this? I'm going to bring you back to this question. I'm going to show you two little, uh, two aspects of what my lab um, works on here at the University of Washington. And one of these is really going to be thinking about that aspect of how do we capture all these stages of development in a way that enables us to screen therapeutics specific to those stages of development such that we can determine if they have promise to move forward um, into the translational pipeline. To do this, we're really motivated by the fact that we need developmentally appropriate models, and we need developmentally appropriate models that can be tuned to a number of different stimuli. I didn't mention on the earlier slide why preterm birth occurs or why perinatal asphyxia occurs, and that was intentional. There's a lot of potential contributing factors, but it's not always clear what causes those outcomes. But we do know that there are a number of things that contribute. For instance, nutrient deficiency in utero, infection or systemic inflammation in utero, and things like that hypoxic ischemic event where you lose oxygen and blood flow. All of these can contribute to brain injury and severity of brain injury. We also know that the degree of prematurity can affect how severe the brain injury is as well. And every single one of these contributing factors results in quite variable outcomes in how the brain responds to that injury. So I have here on the bottom part of this slide three different cross-sections of a brain, and in these cross-sections, you'll see this grayed-out area. And these grayed-out area are representations of clinical data that show where the brain is damaged. And you can see that it's quite different from brain to brain. So we not only have variability across different brains, even potentially from the same stimuli, but also quite a diffuse amount of the brain that's being impacted and multiple regions of the brain that are being impacted. So how can we capture this in a model? We actually pioneered a lot of work in taking living brain tissue and culturing it over time so that we can study the injury response and treatment response to these different stimuli. So what we do is we take a, a, an entire brain, and this can come from a number of different species. You can see here a rat brain that's represented, and I have this little glass sl slide that's cutting through it, and we section this brain into these cross sections. This is kind of if you look at the front of your head and start to section your head back, please don't do that. Um, section your head back, uh, you'll get these nice uh, cross sections of the brain, and we get about 10 to 15 slices out of a newborn brain. We then can cut those in half and then get ourselves up to 20 to 30 uh, living brain tissue slices. Now I'm emphasizing these numbers for a reason. That's up to 30 potential things we can test from a single brain. This enables us to help uh, maintain that complexity of the living brain environment with all the cells and their functionality, which we've proven um, is still true, while also reducing the total number of animals that we have to use. We then put these slices onto membranes to help stabilize them and into a media that contains nutrients and oxygen that allows them to stay alive up to several weeks in time. 
Now, what's really beneficial of having these in slice form is that we can then start to expose these to different stimuli. So we can expose them to nutrient deficiency, oxygen and glucose deprivation, inflammation, any number of toxins. And this allows us to look at stimuli-dependent responses to these different uh, to these different injury patterns. And then we can look at the response to injury as well as to treatment in those different brain regions, capturing that complexity and variability that we see in the patient population. So I'm actually showing you an example of uh, an actual brain slice here. This is from a ferret brain. Uh, so this is actually the living slice. This is a fixed image of that slice on the right-hand side. And what you can see, this is we've just fixed it and stained it with uh, a stain that's, that's the green color that shows us where all the neurons are. And importantly, what I want you to take away from this image is those six different brain regions that we've labeled, which are brain regions that we know are particularly susceptible around birth to these different types of stimuli and injury patterns. So what can we do with this? I'm going to give you a, a, a little bit of um, example of some qualitative data that shows how we might use this model to start to look at response to injury and treatment. So I'm going to focus on a cellular response. This is one of the many metrics that we look at. And I'm going to kind of walk through what we're looking for here. So we would often take these slices and then expose them to a stimuli, and then after the stimuli, treat them with a variety of drugs that we might be interested in moving um, into the translational pipeline. And specifically, what we're going to look at is the cell response of microglia. Now, microglia are really fascinating cells. They're, your, they're often referred to as your brain's resonant immune cells, but they're really there to help maintain a very healthy and happy brain microenvironment. They're surveyors, they're scavengers. They're there to make sure all your other cells are maintaining healthy and, and a healthy uh, state. And up here in this upper left-hand corner, uh, these are microglia from a healthy brain. You can see a couple of things that I want you to note. You can see all these branches, all these arms that these cells have, and all of those are coming off of a central point that's sort of a smaller cell body. And these are all pretty uniformly spaced. Now, this is the normal state, but it's an active state. I have a, a fixed image here, but these are constantly moving around. Their arms are constantly moving around and surveying. But in the presence of disease or injury, these cells change quite drastically, not only in shape, but also in number. They become swollen, they shorten, they retract all their branches, they're no longer as mobile and as surveying as they possibly can be, and they become more dense. And in reality, these cells exist somewhere between these two states most of the time. But when they get into this state and they stay in this state, they actually make things worse. They'll keep driving ongoing injury. So let's take a look at how these respond in that slice model in response to different injuries and treatments. This is going to be a lot of images, but I'm going to walk you through them. So first thing I want you to note is we have in each row three different brain regions. This does correspond to numbers on the previous slide. And then in each column, we have five different experimental conditions. I want you to focus on this first column just to take a, a note of what these cells look like. Again, these cells are all labeled in red. This is a healthy control. And we can see that there is natural regional variability in how these cells respond. That's good. We actually want to capture that. That's what happens um, in, in, the, in the living tissue scenario. But what you can also note if you start to move across one of these rows is that if we have mild injury versus severe injury, we see a pretty drastic response in how those cells behave. Not only do we see a significant change in number, but depending on the region, we also see a significant change in their branching architecture, in their size, in their overall shape. And then we can see if we start to look at treatments of this severe injury, which is what these two different treatments were applied to, also a very different response in with, within each brain region and to each treatment. And our goal with these treatments is to return them back to the healthy state. And some treatments are better at doing that than others. And some treatments are only good at doing that in a single brain region. And so one of the benefits of looking at, uh, at these type of outputs is it allows us to see, is a treatment effective on its own? Or do we need more than one treatment in combination to get a whole brain protective effect? So if we des decide through some, uh, some of these analysis, including looking at how these cells respond and other uh, markers in these slices, that a treatment looks promising or a combination of treatments look promising, what do we then go forward with? Well, we move forward into a lot of where our engineering design of delivery systems comes in. And this comes into the second part of what I want to share with you, which is really motivated by the purpose of medicine which is that medicine, as we all hope and want, should go only where it's needed and last as long as it's needed. 
And all of you have some intuition for this. If you've ever used eye drops, if you've ever used a nasal spray, if you've ever used an inhaler, all three of these delivery systems are designed to give you drug delivery locally to the site at which they're being applied, to your eyes, for instance. And this is designed so that you get the medicine there and that it's lasting as long as the medicine can possibly last. So how do we think about bringing this in to delivery to the brain? And specifically for the neonatal brain. We certainly want to engineer drug delivery systems that are safe and effective and are good at getting the drugs where they need to go. So how do we even begin to approach this? I'm going to bring back in this graphic here just to remind you of our sort of broader picture design considerations of thinking about cost, accessibility, safety, and scale. Because in this patient population, these design considerations really drive a lot of our decision making and what types of materials we work with and how we design our drug delivery systems. For instance, most of the materials that we work with are already FDA approved and typically previously tested in adults. We are trying to put these into newborns, so we need as much safety information as possible in humans. We also work with materials that degrade into components that your body can metabolize or readily clear. And these materials can be controlled for their degradation time by altering the ratio of the materials and the molecular weight uh, of those materials. And then lastly, we'll incorporate a material that often helps reduce your immune system's response to any foreign object that gets put into your body so that we can increase the time that these materials stay within the body. So kind of keeping this in mind and thinking about these engineering design considerations, I want to frame this delivery problem. We're trying to tackle a very complex set of diseases. So what is it that we're actually targeting? We have a lot of opportunities for therapeutic intervention in this patient population. I mentioned that we have this injury or uh, insult that, that uh, initially damages the brain, but this injury actually persists for quite a long period of time. It can go from hours up to weeks or years after the initial insult occurs. So if you have a perinatal asphyxia event around birth and you have a brain injury diagnosis after that, we still see ongoing injury and damage that can take place years after that initial event. So our therapeutic strategy is often to shut that process down or attenuate it, let the normal brain uh, repair and recover itself. And in doing that, we have to think about what's happening within these processes. As part of these ongoing events, we'll have metabolites that are toxic to cells that can accumulate. We'll have cells that no longer can create the energy they need to maintain their normal function, which will also often drive them to death. We'll have seizures that occur. These all tend to get grouped under oxidative stress processes. We also have an inflammatory and an immune response. Those microglial cells I mentioned before are critical players in this response, but often can overdo it and overcompensate. So they'll start with a natural acute response you would have to any sort of injury where you have your immune response, but then they start to become persistent in their activation state and they start to become where, uh, into a state where they're driving ongoing injury. And that can result even in things like tissue scarring within the brain. And of course, both of these process, sets of processes, as well as the initial injury, are going to cause cell death and tissue loss within the brain, both immediately after the injury, as well as in those stages uh, farther, down, uh, farther down the road. So when we're thinking about that engineering design of a drug delivery system, we're really thinking about targeting this window as soon after the injury has occurred or been diagnosed as possible. And we're thinking about de delivering therapeutics that can shut down or attenuate or mitigate these processes. This is not an easy thing to do in the brain, and this is where my lab's expertise really sits, is how we can actually get things into the brain. I'm sure everybody can appreciate that your brain is a highly protected organ. Uh, it's one of the most complex organs in our body, and there are very few things that get across and get into the brain freely, and you all have experience with them. Caffeine, maybe not all of these, nicotine, alcohol, sugars, all readily get into your brain, but pretty much everything else doesn't. And part of that is because we have this barrier that exists between the blood and the brain tissue that's often referred to as the blood-brain barrier. And this barrier is one of the most highly regulated barriers in your body, meaning that anything that interfaces with this barrier is not going to cross into the brain tissue. And if it does, it's actually designed to, to transport it back out uh, into the blood. This barrier is unique in the fact that the cells that make up this barrier and the junctions between those cells are, are very restrictive and very regulated. In, when it's intact or functional, you'll often hear cited that more than 98% of all molecules will not cross it. And so that's a significant problem from a drug delivery perspective. 
Now, let's just keep going on what we'd have to overcome, and we'll come back to tackling the blood-brain barrier in a minute. But let's say we get past that barrier, either because we navigate it or we get locally directed, directly injected into the brain, which is a treatment strategy um, for a lot of disease conditions. If we get past this barrier, we do have to navigate from our site of entry to wherever our target site is, which is not necessarily adjacent to where we entered into the brain tissue. And to do this, we have to wind our way through cells and the stuff that fills the space between cells and really make sure we're not interacting with any of those things until we get to our target site. And this is quite a tortuous path. It's uh, highlighted a little bit here by this dashed line that this little drug delivery system is taking. Now let's say we navigate that path. We then want to have a specific effect only on the cells that are involved in disease and only on the cells that are mediating the disease and not normal, healthy, functioning cells. And that might require us to actually get into the cell or at least have action at that cell interface. So in our, uh, in our lab, a lot of our work is overcoming these barriers and is using a technology, uh, using nanotechnology or nanoparticles to get this site-specific delivery to cells that are involved in the disease to shut down those pathological processes that we saw in that earlier slide by controlling the timing and release of a drug. So I'm going to give a little background on what nanotechnology is, although if you've ever used sunstream, you've already interfaced with it. I like to always contextualize nanotechnology by saying if we take a soccer ball and compare it to the size of the Earth, that difference in size scale is the same as taking a nanoparticle and comparing it to a soccer ball. You could also take an arm hair or a head hair, whichever you have more of, and look at it and say that if I look at a single strand of hair, a nanoparticle is about 10,000 times smaller than that single strand of hair. Now, nanomedicine and the use of nanotechnology in medicine is not new. We have very recent examples in two of our COVID vaccines of the use of a relatively simple but well-established nanoparticle platform that was first discovered in 1964 and approved for clinical use in 1995 and more recently adapted to its use um, for these vaccines uh, in 2020. Now, there are over 100 different uh, clinically approved nanomedicines in the world, but none of them are currently used for pediatric populations uh, for brain injury. What is so cool about this scale is that it really enables a lot of capacity loading of any sort of drug. So I'm gonna walk through this little thought experiment that I, that I always enjoy doing. If we take a control volume, one centimeter cubed, it's got a surface area of six centimeter cubed, and let's say we take the same control volume and we now fill it with one, mil uh, one millimeter cubes. We get a tenfold increase in our total surface area within the same control volume. Now let's take this same control volume and fill it with nanometer, one nanometer cubes. We get a million fold increase in our surface area. You can start to see how much additional capacity we have to interface a drug with that surface area or to load a drug into that same control volume. So we have a high surface area to volume ratio that gives us a lot of capability to load a lot of drugs into a relatively small space. We also have a lot of control over what these nanoparticles look like. So we have composition control. We can change out what the actual base material is. We can change the physical properties of these materials so that we can alter what their size is, what their shape is, how stiff they are, what the roughness of their surface is. We can control their surface chemistry, so we can change whether they're positively charged, negatively charged, neutral, hydrophilic, hydrophobic. We can also change what their surface functionality is. Do we put something on there that is actively engaging with its surrounding environment? So what we're going to do now is take a look at each of these barriers and using this as a key, show what work we've done to say how we can tune the nanoparticle design to navigate a drug into the brain. So we'll walk through each of these barriers and we'll look at some of the design considerations. And I'm gonna keep this key in the upper right hand corner so you can kind of see what aspects of the design it is that we're tuning. So first, if we look at overcoming the blood brain barrier, one of the things that we've shown is that if you put surface functionality on a nanoparticle, which are gonna be red in all of our images, and you have it so that it's not specifically interacting, interacting with, blood cell, uh, with these blood vessels, we see it stay pretty localized into these blood vessels. If we just shift that surface functionality so it actively engages with those cells, we can actually get particles into cells within the brain. And you can see this quantified here where if we make this change, we're actually able to get a lot more of the dose that was injected into the body into the brain tissue and not in these brain vessels. So surface functionality helps give us, gives us one knob that we can tune to get across that barrier. Another knob that we can tune is shape. 
And this has been work largely done by other labs, particularly Samir Mitra Gotri's lab at Harvard. If we take a spherical nanoparticle and we elongate it, we make it more elliptical, we can increase the permeability across that barrier as well, just by altering the shape of the particle and not the, the size or the uh, composition. And we've also done work showing that if we control that surface charge, so if we take something that's neutral, positive, or negatively charged, and we inject them into the bloodstream and we look at their ability to cross the barrier, we see that things that are neutrally charged or negatively charged are able to localize in cells, whereas things that pos are positively charged stay restricted to that blood vasculature. Now notice here I didn't mention anything about composition. Every single one of these systems is a different composition and a different size. So these are four nanometers, these are a little over 200 nanometers, and these are 60 to 80 nanometers. We do see a wide size range that can cross this barrier, and we right now we see no dependence on composition in getting across this particular barrier. However, if we start to look at barriers afterwards, we start to have to refine our engineering design criteria. So for instance, even if we get across this barrier and we're 200 nanometers in size, we've started to see that that really restricts your ability to move through the brain tissue itself. So if we look, for instance, at a 200 nanometer versus a 40 nanometer particle, our 200 nanometers are in red, our 40 nanometers in green, and these are images around the site of entry of these particles in the brain, we see that there's a size restriction here that allows, that allows us or doesn't allow us to move away from our site of entry. We also see a similar effect if we're charged versus if we're neutral. So if we've gotten across the blood-brain barrier, we do need to have closer to neutrality on our surface to actually be able to penetrate within the brain tissue space. A lot of this work is actually done um, with a technique that we've developed where in living brain tissue, we'll track these individual nanoparticles and how they behave and move in the space. If you can see these tiny little red dots moving around, these are tiny little red dots moving around in a living brain. So these are nanoparticles in a brain. And we'll actually track these and quantify their ability to navigate and utilize and experience this entire space uh, within the tissue. But you can see now we're starting to refine down what size, uh, what uh, design criteria we have to think about if we're going to continue to navigate all these barriers. So we might have started out with a bigger design space, but as we move through these barriers, we have to we have to narrow that down. And in this case, to get through the brain tissue itself, we need to be smaller uh, and potentially more neutral. Now the last uh, the last uh, target or barrier is getting into specific cells, and this is an aspect that we've shown that either through tailoring of the surface chemistry, so the charge on the particle, or how that charge is imparted through the different functional groups you can add, we can tune whether a nanoparticle goes into one cell type or another. And so I'm showing you here the same particle system but with two different functional groups on the surface of the particle. Again, the particles are all in red. And these, this one particle type is getting into microglia. We change the charge and the functionality, and we can direct them into neurons. And this could be beneficial if you think back to the therapeutic opportunities we're trying to target. If we want to attenuate the inflammatory response, rather than specifically getting into neurons, maybe getting a drug into microglia would be more beneficial than getting the drug into neurons. So having this tunability is beneficial if we're thinking about drugs that might need to do different things. So let's put this all together. Let's integrate this, uh, all these design criteria into, into sort of one set of general criteria and see if that then enables us to actually get into regions of injury specifically uh, and into cells involved in injury. So I'm gonna summarize over here on the left-hand side some of the criteria that we have identified is really necessary for any type of nanoparticle, regardless of its composition, to be able to be effective at getting to specific cells within the brain. Generally, we need to be small. To get through that tissue barrier, we need to be spherical. We need to be close to near neutral. There's a lot of different ways that can be achieved. And we need to be amphiphilic, so a combination of maybe lipophilic um, and hydrophilic. I put this little asterisk here because we have by no means figured out everything. There is a lot of design parameters we have not been able to isolate or consider, and that's where a lot of our work with really skilled collaborators comes into play. But even just taking this criteria, I can show you that we can get very selective and specific uptake. So this image here is a cross-section of a newborn rabbit with cerebral palsy. And what we're looking at here that's outlined in this dashed white lines are specifically the injured areas within the brain. In red is our nanoparticles, and you can see they're pretty well localized to this injured area and not taken up into the uninjured area. We've also done some downstream analysis that was in this paper that shows that these are getting into cells that are mediating the ongoing injury in these cerebral palsy animals.
And so this gives us pretty good confidence that even with this set of design criteria, even if we haven't figured out all the other bells and whistles that can be tuned, that we can get very selective uptake into regions of injury uh, in the newborn injured brain. So now let's bring a drug into the equation, because so far we've only shown what the delivery system can do. So what if we actually put a drug into this system and then see if it can improve brain outcomes and brain health, which is our uh, end goal? So I'm bringing in here the same slide that I showed you before. We're still working with relatively simple systems. We only have two materials in the system. And then we're incorporating a drug that is not soluble or stable if you were to put it into your body in its free form. We also work with drugs. We're not in the business of drug discovery. There's a lot of great drugs out there. We believe that oftentimes they aren't effective because they can't get to where they need to go. And so a lot of the drugs that we work with are drugs that have been tested in adult populations, but not in the newborn or pediatric population. So if we take a drug and we put it into one of our nanoparticles that has all of those design criteria in mind, and then we apply it to one of our models of neonatal brain injury, what are the outcomes that we can achieve? We're gonna show you some data here um, that's from one of the field standard models of neonatal brain injury. This is in the late preterm rat. A late preterm rat is the equivalent of 35 to 36 weeks gestation in a human. And this is a model where we're depriving the brain of oxygen and glucose. Um, so we're basically cutting off blood flow for a period of time. Now the outcomes of this model are hopefully very clear in these two representative images. A healthy brain is fully intact. And if you see this sort of dark purple layer here, this is a really critical cell layer representative of a macrostructure that you need in your brain uh, to be present for cognitive function. You can see in the injury model in our untreated injured brain, a lot of tissue loss, complete tissue loss in some cases, as well as loss of that macrostructure. And so we would measure this by looking at the percent of tissue lost uh, in, these uninjured, uh, in these injured untreated controls and our treatment controls. So if we look at this data, I'm gonna sh uh, show you here, we have four different treatment groups. We have our drug by itself, no nanoparticle, our empty nanoparticle, no drug, and then our drug-loaded nanoparticle that's designed with those design considerations in mind, and then an untreated control group. The higher the percent area loss, the worse the brain injury is, the lower, the better. And so what we're looking for is a reduction in that brain injury. And we can see here that our reduction in brain injury is pretty good um, for our drug-loaded nanoparticle, particularly compared to all of our controls. We can also visually see this if we look at pathology from these animals. So if we take a look again at our drug-loaded nanoparticle here on the right-hand side, you see this nice preservation of the tissue, pretty comparable to that of the healthy brain, as well as this really important preservation of this key cell layer that's again necessary for cognitive function. And we don't see preservation of the tissue or that cell layer with our treatment controls. So this is work that has been really promising uh, for us to be taking a drug and a delivery system that hasn't previously been tested uh, in these models or in this patient population and showing good therapeutic outcomes. But I wanna bring you back to an earlier slide of this is just one age at which this injury occurs. And so it's really important for us, again, to keep the clinical scenario in mind. We don't know if a therapeutic like this will work at all developmental stages in which these brain injuries occur. And so it's important for us to then test this in those developmentally appropriate models. We're now gonna do that in the in vivo model rather than in those slice models. And in this case, we're using the same model, but just in different developmental ages. So late preterm, again, 35 to 36 weeks gestation in the human, Term is 40 weeks equivalent gestation in the human, and late term is gonna be 41 weeks gestation uh, in the human. And so if we take a look now at two different drugs, again, that we're loading into these nanoparticles with those general design criteria, a small molecule and an enzyme if we wanted to replace an enzyme in the brain that's been depleted, we're gonna look at the effect of the developmental age in which the injury occurs on these two therapeutic outcomes. First, you can see that if we have uh, both of these drugs side-by-side -side comparison, again, lower area loss is better, that's a healthier brain, we can see that our enzyme therapeutic might be a more effective therapeutic at this treatment stage, uh, at this uh, developmental age, than our small molecule therapeutic. And this is particularly, uh, was exciting to us, and I'll just note this, because this is pretty severe brain injury that we're seeing, and there's currently no treatment for babies with severe brain injury. And we're seeing a reduction with both drugs, but perhaps a more favorable reduction um, with our enzyme therapeutic.
Now, what's interesting is this effect is almost entirely lost if we go to a term equivalent brain injury. So this is why we especially think it's important to be looking at developmentally appropriate stages of these models. We see that both drugs seem to lose their effectiveness if the brain injury occurs around term. It's also important to note you see a reduction in the total severity of this injury. I'm happy to get into why that is um, in the questions, but this is not uh, surprising based on what we would see in the clinical scenario. What was surprising is that neither drug was necessarily effective at treating um, this injury at this age. If we look at late term, we see that, in, that perhaps our small molecule drug is actually more effective at treating late term brain injury compared to our enzyme therapeutic. And this is, I think, important data for us to continue to develop and continue to look at for different drugs because it suggests that because these physiologies are unique at different developmental stages and the brain is going to respond to injury differently at different developmental stages, we might need unique the therapeutic strategies for these stages as well. Now, there's definitely some promise in this approach and this pipeline. I had the opportunity while I was in my training at Johns Hopkins to work with two incredible individuals, Kanan Rangamanujam and Sujatha Kanan, and they had done a lot of work on a nanoparticle platform to advance it into use for children uh, who suffer from cerebral palsy. And their nanoparticle platform was actually designed in such a way that it, it meets all of our design criteria. And what was really exciting to see was that in 2017, this platform was approved by the FDA to move into clinical trials for a fatal neurological disease that, that uh, tends to kill children by the age of five. And this is exciting because it shows that if we take this very comprehensive approach to thinking about the design of our system, something that's scalable, something that's relatively simple, something that meets these general design criteria, and we do so in a collaborative way, which was a fun group to work with um, in my training at Hopkins. We had 15 different departments that were invested in this research. Um, we're able to get these therapeutic platforms that do have translational potential. And we just wrapped up uh, phase two clinical trials uh, a couple of months ago. So what I hopefully have been able to show you uh, and give some insights into this evening is that there are limited treatment op uh, options for this particular patient population. And this is a, a especially pressing problem because neonatal and childhood diseases really make up a significant portion of the global burden of disease. And that might continue to grow as we see more and more babies born preterm that to test therapeutics in, uh, for this patient population, we do need our models to be developmentally appropriate, and we have ways to, to develop systems that can do that, that can capture the complexity of the injury, the variability of the injury that we see, and be able to tune it to different ways that the injury might occur. That it is difficult to get things into the brain, but we have some promise using nanotechnology as a safe uh, platform that could be useful in treating disease, the diseased newborn brain. But we need to be purposeful and intentional in our design of these systems. Uh, I always like to tell my lab, uh, who could certainly tell you that I say this all the time, don't over-engineer something unless you, unless you need to. Keeping a system simple helps keep it scalable and more cost-effective. And we've seen that those relatively simple systems, relative for a nanoparticle anyway, um, are pretty effective in improving brain health in the newborn. So I want to close by circling back uh, to thanking uh, all of the people who contributed to this work. Uh, I've highlighted in bold specific uh, students that I got to uh, show some research from uh, and collaborators that I got to show some research from. Uh, so very grateful and want to acknowledge their contributions. We have a fantastic team here at the University of Washington where we have a lot of fun and try not to take ourselves too seriously. I certainly want to thank our animals. We, we absolutely cannot do this research without them. And uh, as you can hopefully see uh, by, by this uh, funding list, we have a number of different funders and supporters of our research. I actually think this speaks a lot to the interdisciplinarity um, of the work uh, as well. I want to thank everybody for their attention, and I will be happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. I'd like to remind everybody online and here in the room, if you would like to submit a question, please email it to coeevent at uw.edu. Questions will be transmitted to me here on the tablet in front of me, and we'll be able to take 10, 10 to 15 minutes of questions. So uh, go ahead. This is one time when you're in class, you can get your phone out and, and send messages. Please do so. Uh, I have a few already in here, and so we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, 
Elizabeth, how long do you think it'll take therapies, like these nanomedicine type therapies, uh, in your lab to reach patients and consumers uh, for, for infants and babies? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think the approach we're taking is to try and minimize that time scale as much as possible, but we're still talking probably a 10 to 15 year mm -hmm. time scale from initial idea generation to actual clinical trial uh, stages. And so I think that's a pretty uh, realistic setting, and I'm mostly speaking to that from the experience of that platform that I got to work on um, that is moving in, that's in clinical trials right now. Interesting. And can you comment, is the regulatory landscape really different for approving drugs for, for yeah, so in this pediatric is a, setting? Yeah, so this is a great question. It's a fascinating area. Um, so the patient population is relatively small. Uh, doing clinical trials in kids is difficult because the regulatory process, particularly for new technologies, um, isn't always well defined. And so one of the things that we aim to work on is uh, it's one of the reasons why we work on things that have been tested in adults to try and speed that up. But there's also regulations and policies that are required by governments, uh, the Euro you know, Europe and the U.S., that we need in place to facilitate, um, facilitate the technology development as well. And there have been some policies implemented in 2014 and 2017 that are really intended to make it easier to move technologies into clinical trials, at least for things that you can inject into a person. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I like this one. What's the role of machine learning and artificial intelligence in, in advancing your research? Yeah, so we didn't get to talk about this at all today, um, but if everybody remembers this slide, I'll pull it back up. Um, this slide is actually a really great example of where we utilize machine learning. So you might be able to tell by eye some of the major changes that are taking place, the shape the branching, um, but if you are looking at hundreds or thousands of these cells across a wide range of samples, it's useful to have a machine help identify patterns that you might not be able to recognize. And actually, one of our students in the lab, Holly, just uh, developed a, a pipeline that allows us to take all these images and analyze them and be able to predict what actual shape of these cells or what types of these cells do we need present to have a therapeutic effect. And so I think that's really exciting because it gives us a way to make our data work more for us. Awesome. Here's a sharp-eyed audience member. Uh -oh. On one of your slides, it seemed like 200 nanometer particles tended to stay localized, whereas 40 nanometer particles have better diffusivity. Do you envision a case where mixtures of sizes may be better suited if you want to have variance in, in where particles go? Yeah, this is a great question. It's actually one that we've explored and looked into. Um, these, uh, I believe this is the slide that was being referred to, um, these are actually very well controlled size distributions of this particular particle platform. The, the platforms that we're using, um, when we actually load a drug into them and, and deliver them into our animal models, have a much more dispersed size range. And so we're probably already taking advantage of that a little bit. And by much more dispersed, I mean like 20 nanometers variance. These have like no nanometer variance um, in all the particles that are being submitted. But there is some thinking that depending on the stages that you might need to target a drug for, um, if you know, you know, you want to suppress something and then have something else happen afterwards, that having a mixture of these systems could be useful. It does add difficulty in the translation process because the more mixed and complicated and less defined your system is, uh, the, more, the less likely it is to actually get through FDA approval process. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a broader question. What, what insights uh, do you have about possible future therapies for the pediatric autistic brain? Oh, uh, that's a, a great question and a, and a tricky one, I think, um, because it, in many cases we need to know what we're targeting um, for a therapy to be effective. Um, and there's still a lot of research that needs to be done in understanding, I think, what are potential therapeutic targets in autism? Um, what aspects of autism are we working to address? Um, if there is a quality of life improvement opportunity that we can do with a drug, um, what, is, what is going to be the benefit of that relative to um, the risk of putting a patient through having injections and having regular treatments? Um, and so I think it's a, that's a tricky space to explore. Some of the, uh, some of the outcomes with uh, newborns with neonatal brain injury certainly um, do uh, have an autistic component to them. So cerebral palsy and autism are two increased incidents that you see from newborns with neonatal brain injury. So I guess we're, we potentially are kind of getting treatment in before that might even be the case in this particular patient population. That's awesome. 
Before I ask another question, I'll note there's a lot of awesome questions coming in, and this is great. Keep them coming because I will volunteer Elizabeth to answer the remainder of them on her Instagram account, which she often does and loves to do. So uh, don't laugh, you'll like it. Um, so uh, there's a question ab about, can you comment and maybe describe briefly the technology and machines that, that your lab uses to actually make the nanoparticles? Yeah, um, it's probably going to be a pretty boring answer. Um, we take, uh, our, our systems are generally made up of polymers, which are often required to be solubilized in an organic solvent rather than something like water. Uh, we'll put those into an organic solvent. We'll have our drug um, or some other components in an aqueous solvent, and we mix them together. Um, and that's about the extent of it. It's not super fancy. Um, it is scalable uh, in many cases. Um, and there's certainly other aspects of that mixing process that you can bring technology into, like using microfluidics, for instance, um, using high energy pulsing uh, to control the size distribution. Um, but it's actually a relatively uh, straightforward and simple process with, with very little fancy equipment um, involved. Another question about the actual nanoparticles themselves. Uh, how do you make sure that the materials that make up the nanoparticles, and I think the, the audience member is asking about the drug specifically, how do you make sure it binds into the nanoparticle given the building blocks you have? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's really dependent on um, the material that you use and the drug. Um, and so we, we certainly try and take advantage of a drug that might be physically entrapped within these particle systems. Um, one of the ways that I always appreciated having this explained to me is if you think about these um, polymers, they kind of look like it as little balls of spaghetti, and the drug is like the sauce that's kind of getting intertwined with the spaghetti. And you know, for those of you who roll your spaghetti up on forks, that's a thing, I'm pretty certain. Um, you're getting that sauce kind of intermixed throughout the entire set of spaghetti noodles, right? So we're kind of taking advantage of a very similar process where we have this strong association between our drug for some drugs and the material that we're using, and we're physically entrapping it in. You can also chemically conjugate um, to these materials as well, and that can be useful if you know how to release that chemical conjugation when you need the drug um, to release too. Awesome. This question is about different animal models. And so what, what are the considerations taken when choosing between animal models? You, you, I think you had two or three featured here in your talk, and you may use other ones. How do therape therapeutic effects differ between different animal models? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, and I'm actually just going to go back to this acknowledgment slide, because I have three different species up here. Rats, rabbits, that's a baby rabbit in the middle there. These are all baby uh, animals, which is why they're so cute, um, and ferrets on this slide. And I think it's partly what injury are you trying to recreate? Um, the brains of these species do not replicate the human brain perfectly. So in a rabbit, for instance, there's a portion of the brain in the rabbit that develops exactly as the human brain does, but only a portion of it. The ferret has actually all of these um, folds in it that really nicely mimic a human brain. So if we look at, for instance, this slide, we can see um, in this image here all these nice little folds. That's exactly mimicking what a human brain does. A rat brain, which is actually represented here, does not have that. And so depending on what you're trying to study, different animal models can give you insights that are more relevant um, to, the, to the human population or to the patient population um, that you're looking at. And I, I should say that different species have different susceptibilities to different injuries. Um, so there is some benefit in testing across multiple species um, to see if what you're seeing in one is, is um, conserved in another, and that gets us closer and closer to being confident in what's going to happen uh, in the human. Mm -hmm. Great. Do you have time for one more question? I think so. Great. Um, so this one's kind of a broader, a broader one related to the brain, uh, which I think you'll like answering. For adults who are fully recovered from previous brain trauma, like brain surgeries, craniotomy, et cetera, what are additional risks that you can comment out about brain decline over life, additional potential recommended actions? Okay, I'm gonna steal an answer to this out of my husband's playbook because this is where his area of expertise is. Um, I think it's, it's actually you can, you can use uh, children as an example, right? When a child is growing up, they're constantly engaged with their world. They're constantly challenging their mind. They're constantly learning new things. And one of the benefits that's been seen in the literature, not work that we've done, is that if you keep your brain engaged um, after a brain injury later in life, you're able to help, that, uh, help your brain stay active and, and keep those cells healthy and functioning. Your brain needs those inputs, just like it does early in life, it also needs those inputs later in life. Um, and so there has been some benefit shown of having that level of engagement and input um, it, even after brain injury as well.
There's one more I'm going to ask that I think will be a good note to end on. And, and this uh, audience member is really, I think, taken by your illustration about how small nanoparticles mm. are. And so the question is really, how do you make sure these you know, tiny nanoparticles really are strong enough? You know, if you're thinking about a pill you might ingest or drugs we commonly interact with, and is it really a matter of just dosage and having so many more of those nanoparticles or you know, just kind of leaving us with some thoughts about how to think about the nano world? Yeah, this is a great question. So actually, um, it's probably the inverse answer from what you would expect. Um, if you have a particle system that has access to parts of a tissue or a cell that um, a drug in pill form or in free form because it's not protected would not have access to, it doesn't mean that you need more of the drug there. It just need, it means you need the drug to get just where it's going. So in this uh, work here, we actually showed that you could use up to a hundredfold lower dose of a drug conjugated to a nanoparticle than of the free drug on its own. And that's because we're increasing the specificity of the drug. We're getting the drug exactly where it needs to go rather than having it go throughout the entire body. And so it's actually not a volume or a total mass amount. It's more of the control of where the drug is going and how specific it is um, that I think these particles enable the most. But having that design space to put as much drug or different drugs, I think um, is a good sort of you know, space to be able to play around with. Awesome. Well, that was a great range of questions. Thank you so much to the audience. Let's thank our speaker one more time for a great presentation. And thank you to the audience here and at home for participating and submitting so many thoughtful questions. We hope you enjoyed our engineering lecture series this year. And as a reminder, you can find recordings of both lectures on the College of Engineering website. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you again. <laughs>